So together, we've come a long way since, say, the early 1990s, when we talk about cacao and cocoa, in our understanding of coffee farm workers. You know, right now, the SCAA board of directors includes three coffee producers. And international membership has been outpacing domestic membership in recent years. But when it comes to farm workers, you know, not so much. We seem to have believed that if we are connected to and taking care of farmers, then farmers will take care of farm workers. And that's fair in as much as any business takes care of its employees, but we no longer expect that coffee retailers will speak on behalf of all baristas, nor would we expect that the CEO of a roasting company would reflect the expectations and opinions of everyone working on the shipping line. When we put that expectation on coffee farmers, it's an unfair one, not just for farm workers, but also for the farmers themselves. Because this is not a farmer's problem. We have created a system based on an economic model that relies on free or underpaid labor. So there's no way that we can expect worker wages to increase when there's no reflection of that in the market that they're selling into. So if one argument for taking action on farm workers now is the arc of moral history, and another reason is the brand reputation of specialty coffee, then I believe that the most compelling reason for us to be paying attention to this right now is that this issue is affecting farmers that we work with. And so far, even in our strongest relationships, we haven't really been talking to farmers about this or listening to what they have to say. So in this last segment, you will hear from, as well as about, coffee farmers and coffee farm workers. And we'll begin this in Nicaragua. So there are three refrains that come up a lot about Nicaragua and specialty coffee. The first of which is that Nicaragua is the second poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. I can't tell you how many times I've heard this since I first traveled to Nicaragua to visit coffee farms more than a decade ago. I don't know if this is true or if it matters whether it is true, but it's one of the ways that the country is most likely to be characterized. The second refrain is that Nicaragua is a bastion of fair trade. Countless cooperatives formed under the Sandinista government in the 1980s, and some of the coffee cooperatives that formed during those years or formed before and were strengthened during those years are some of the most active and admired in specialty coffee even today. The third refrain is that Nicaragua is safe. So despite its poverty, it has largely been insulated from the violence and drug trafficking that have plagued its northern neighbors. And Nicaragua's coffee sector shares much with those northern neighbors, including geography and coffee varieties and you know, big things like language. And it also shares similarities with Costa Rica and Panama to the south. But in other ways, Nicaragua is unique in Central America. And Central America, although geographically tiny, has an enormous influence in coffee's history, especially specialty coffee, and especially here in the United States. We owe much of our collective knowledge to what we have learned from Central America's coffee farmers, coffee varieties, institutions, and trading practices. When it comes to farm workers, there's much we can learn from paying attention to what's happening right now in Central America. La Prensa is Nicaragua's largest national daily newspaper. And this headline comes from January of this year. The headline here roughly translates as, coffee is falling off the trees for lack of pickers in the region of Nueva Segovia. And the potentially more obvious subheading is that labor is migrating to Honduras because the pay there is better. A decade ago, it wasn't uncommon for coffee pickers from Nicaragua to leave the country for Costa Rica. But now Honduras, which has invested heavily in the productivity of its coffee sector, is providing another attractive alternative. Productivity is important, by the way, because most coffee pickers get paid by volume and not by the day or by the hour. Even El Salvador, which offers pretty small coffee volumes, is appealing because payment there is made in dollars. And the Nicaraguan Cordoba has weakened against the American dollar in recent years. But in order to understand what farmers and farm workers are facing, it's important to hear their experiences. So the lived experience that I received when I traveled to Nicaragua in January, just a week after this headline, adds context to what you're reading here. It can help answer questions. So we'll be hearing from coffee farmers, smallholder members of the Cinco de Junio Cooperative, 
and farmers and farm workers from larger farms, Selva Negra in Hinotega and La Revancha in Matagalpa, as you will see. mano de obra es muy, es muy difícil porque muchos jóvenes como que anterior le tenían más amor a, a lo que es el café pero como que ahora casi como que no verdad unos cogen para otro o que se van para otro lado porque en otros lados pagan mejores en Honduras dicen que están pagando bien y entonces se van para allá la gente lo único que a veces se nos hace difícil ¿verdad? porque usted sabe que soy una mujer sola eh, solo con mi hijo, eh, tengo cinco hijos, pero de cinco hijos ya se han ido casando. Y ya solo me quedó uno, el Chele, que es el único que me ayuda. Eh, aquí, ya ¿Y dónde la gente nos ayuda. Ajá. ¿Dónde se han ido? Los, eh, se han casado, una para Managua, la otra para León. El otro eh, emigró para Costa Rica porque en esto de que no hay trabajo acá, entonces ellos emigran a, a buscar la vida a otro lado. ¿no? Y solo me he quedado con el único que es que estudia el chaval pequeño, el último. Como estudia, pues ahí lo estamos apoyando. Y es difícil, ahorita yo estaba pensando emigrar más bien para poder ayudar a mi hijo. As far as having less labor, yes, it will come. Because the more people get educated, and in Nicaragua there is a big uh, 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 training on middle class. There is a lot of technical schools, a lot of emphasis being done on educating people middle levels. And those people want to have a better job. They don't want to work on the field anymore. Even if it is uh, um, on a desk just putting information in a computer, the same monotonous work or answering phone and, or anything like it, they want to feel they're working on, on, a, on an office. It's working on an office sounds very important. So, yes, it will become very scarce. No, mi mayoría de hijos que tengo, los tengo en El Salvador trabajando. Ellos vienen cada año aquí. Yo solo vivo con mi esposa y, y tengo tres hijos más, los más pequeños y unas nietas que viven conmigo. Yo aquí estoy temporal, vengo tres, cuatro días y me regreso a mi casa. Mi marido es el que trabaja aquí, yo no. ¿Qué piensas que van a hacer? Las dos están estudiando, las dos, y no pienso eso. Van a hacer en la vida otra cosa. So let's review the issues that we're hearing about. The first is migration. You know, I mentioned earlier that the Nicaraguan Cordoba has weakened against the American dollar recently, which is taking people outside of the country to find work. People who until recently were picking coffee are now leaving coffee and leaving the country. The second issue is generational transition. Young people in Central America don't necessarily want to farm coffee, much less pick coffee, and their parents aren't always fighting to keep them on the farm, especially when alternatives exist elsewhere. For example, the total value of remittances to Nicaragua in 2015 was three times the value of the country's coffee exports. The third is coffee rust. So Guatemala's National Coffee Association estimates, based on reportings from various Central American coffee institutions, that 18 million bags of coffee were lost between 2012 and 2015. Add that to the already, you know, always seasonal and sometimes informal nature of coffee employment, and people who worked on coffee farms have left and haven't returned. You know, farmers were experiencing shortfalls of between 20 and 80 percent, so there was no way for them to hire the same number of pickers. And although production has recovered somewhat since 2012, the workers have moved on. Now, Central American governments are not blind to the issues that are being caused by labor scarcity. And for example, in January, El Salvador's government raised the national minimum wage by 4 percent, which should be good for everyone. But is it? El, algunos que, que tienen sus cafetales también pegados donde mí, lo mismo, están, los están dejando que se, que se enmonten, que se pierdan últimamente, porque no hayan mano de obra, ¿sí? Muchos, muchos, muchos cafetaleros están buscando otro rubro, 
porque creen que el café es muy barato y no, no, no es suficiente. Bueno, el porcentaje, eh, el trabajo de, 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 en el café en su gran mayoría es, es manual. En su gran mayoría es manual. Eh, es probable que la parte del costo de producción esté cercano al 60% en el tema de los salarios. Bueno, tal vez un poco más. Eh, tendría que, que ajustar cifras, pues por aproximadamente anda en el orden de un 60% el costo de, de la mano de obra. Una, una de las razones por las cuales pues, eh, lo del cambio es precisamente por el tema de los precios. ¿no? Eh, los precios, la caída de la bolsa, eh, el tema de, 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 del incremento también de los costos ¿no? en campo, producto de la llegada de la roya producto del cambio climático, de las sequías y todos esos asuntos que nos han afectado, pues obviamente pues, nos han hecho realizar ajustes para poder o sea, seguirnos manteniendo sobre la, la, en, en el rubro. Eh, definitivamente pues, ha sido bien complicado, bien difícil, porque esto nos ha llevado a generar cambios en, en toda la cadena, digamos. So Orlando Oyes mentions price as a complicating factor. The New York sea price was around 115 at the time of this interview, and it hasn't changed much since. So while farmers may agree that worker wages need to increase and support the action of governments in theory, it's difficult for them to increase wages when they look around and see that the sea market doesn't respond to the threat of regional shortage. It may be difficult for the specialty community to believe that Central America could be struggling, and it wouldn't make a difference, but that's the world we're living in. Coffee is getting more expensive to produce and cheaper to buy. Rodrigo Gonzalez estimates that 60% of his total cost of production is labor. And even if it's 50% or 40%, that still means that low prices effectively mandate low wages. And how can we expect a farmer to increase worker wages and invest in renovating old coffee plantations new, you know, support new infrastructure and adapt to climate change, not to mention sending his kids to school or paying her cell phone bills. My presentation has been pretty bleak so far, but there's reason for optimism in Nicaragua. You know, Central America's coffee volumes may be small, but its influence is enormous. This is where we, as buyers, as farmers, as a community, can get creative. Because while Brazil is demonstrating leadership at a national level, Nicaragua is incubating innovation at a farm level. There are examples here to learn from, and I want to talk about two of those examples. Mousy Cool and her husband Eddie bought a coffee farm in Hinotega in 1973. Both are descendants of German families that founded some of the country's first coffee farms, but they had a different model in mind, and that model has only strengthened over time. The Selva Negra Eco Lodge was the first project to diversify their income and provide alternative employment, and in the intervening decades, it has grown to include jobs raising animals off of restaurant scraps, building furniture for the hotel rooms, and making European-style cheeses, in addition to the, more common, the activities more commonly associated with the production of organic and specialty coffee, like composting. Selva Negra employs more than 900 people at the peak of harvest, and they have never had to advertise for pickers. They also house more than 600 people, including permanent workers who are raising a fourth generation on the farm. It's unusual for owners of a farm as large as Selva Negra to live on the farm as they do, but their modest house overlooking coffee drying patios is a testament to the zeal that they feel, not only for their coffee, but for the entire community that is supported by and on the farm. La Revancha in Maragalpa offers different lessons. Until Rodrigo Gonzalez retired from 30 years in the military in 2007, he and Cecilia Pineda sold the farm's coffee on the local market at whatever price they could get for it, and they hoped to cover their costs. Once they dedicated themselves full to the farm full time, they sought alternatives to this catch-as-catch-can sales model. And one of those alternatives they looked into was fair trade certification. It seemed like a natural fit for their values and because of their pre-existing relationships with some of the strong and politically active cooperatives in Nicaragua. But at the time, fair trade certification only applied to smaller farms than theirs. While La Revancha is smaller than Selva Negra and tiny compared to many of the farms that we're talking about in Brazil, 
it still employs more than 550 people at the peak of the coffee harvest. Their patience and persistence for the, and dedication to the idea paid off, though, when they were able to sign up as a pilot farm for the Fair Trade for All project initiated by Fair Trade USA. Fair Trade USA brought in United Farm Workers for help in training and empowering farm workers. And since 2014, milestones and achievements include management and worker training and benchmarks for gender inclusion and workforce stability, and also the commitment to raising worker wages by 50% over three years, supported by coffee buyers. The relationship and the training have changed both the farm's owners and the farm's workers in ways that neither group would have imagined when they went into it. And for the third consecutive year, workers from La Revancha will be attending the SCAA Expo this weekend. In fact, they'll be participating in a panel discussion on Friday. So I imagine that they are the only farm workers to attend, and I know that they're the only ones to speak. So we keep a big, big staff, but there is a lot of different things to be done. I mean, the cheese room has like four or five people, the guys that handle the, the milking cows and the calf and the chicken and the pigs and now the piglets and, uh, and the guys that take care of the of fruits and the vegetable garden that's becoming very big. We have there a big staff and like that, it's increasing. Siempre lo ha gustado venir aquí porque el, la, la comida pues, ¿verdad? Es, es más, más tremenda que en otros lugares porque también hay, hay patrones que se descuidan mucho los trabajadores y le dan un maltrato en la comida, en la dormida, que eso es lo primordial que tienen que tener las haciendas cafetaleras, que tengan un buen mantenimiento este, para el trabajador también porque hay haciendas que al trabajador lo miran como cualquier cosa, como, como animal pues más que todo, ¿verdad? Y nosotros, bueno, sabemos que esta hacienda pues se man, un mantenimiento pues, para los trabajadores, una, una comida asiadita, este, bastante también, ¿verdad? Entonces, por eso nos gusta venir aquí. Se ha notado que hay, hay este, un mayor compromiso con la empresa de parte de los trabajadores desde que estamos certificados hay un mayor compromiso de ellos hacia, hacia la empresa porque al final de cuentas este camino lo llevamos juntos es decir, la empresa no es una y ellos son otros sino que aquí lo que hacemos es una combinación de un esfuerzo que la empresa desarrolla que hace partícipe a los trabajadores y juntos empujamos la carreta, juntos hacemos el esfuerzo por eso, por, eso es que, por eso es que es importante la participación de ellos en, en este esfuerzo, porque solo yo no, 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 no lo puedo hacer todo, pues necesito de ellos. Ah, claro que sí, porque antes no teníamos una comunicación con ella, ni con él. Venían ellos, ellos se iban y no, no, nosotros no nos acercábamos porque teníamos miedo tal vez hablar con ellos. Pero cuando logramos esta certificación, ellos nos dijeron, no, nosotros nos sentimos igual como a ustedes. Y cualquier cosa, vengan aquí, pregúntenme a mí que algo está pasando, díganos. Entonces parece que es uno el que es como miedoso a hablarle a alguien de que uno lo ve más grande y uno más bajo. Y, y, pero ella dijo, somos iguales todos. So I've been talking about two farms that have taken radical approaches to workforce stabilization on their farms. The first has diversified so thoroughly as to effectively create its own labor market and take itself out of the local labor market. And the second is ideologically driven to not just include coffee farm workers, but empower the workers on their farm and to be open to outside help in doing so. Neither of these farms is typical. And many people would argue that neither of these farms' approaches are scalable or necessarily reflective of the wider world. And I agree that two farms in the context of a coffee-producing country and region and world do not a movement make. But these farms are leaders. La Revancha and Selva Negra are taking action. They are innovating and creating solutions to the problems that they see and are confronting them. And they're looking for support from our community in continuing this work. 
This is an audience of innovators. This is an audience of entrepreneurs. And so I hope that you see these examples and you feel inspired and start to think about what you can do in your own coffee supply chains. Because we need this innovation and we need more. We've come a long way in the way that we think about coffee farms and what we know about coffee farmers. But we have a long way to go when it comes to coffee farm workers. So I hope that we can start to listen. And with that, I'd like the last voice in this segment to come from a coffee farm worker. Marlene de Jesus Gonzalez Garcia from La Revancha. ¿Es suficiente lo que gana el trabajador? No. No. Ni cerca. Ni cerca. Porque yo les decía que hay en los estados una taza de café vale más que un día de un trabajador aquí. Sí, y y de, les decía yo que así como ellos no saben que, que, que si, si el café solo se vendió y ya, tampoco los de allá no saben que quién corta el café, que lo que lo compran, se lo toman y ya. También ellos no tienen esa experiencia. Thank you.